assure you that what you will observe is a vast wasteland. I am to try and channel it. The 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 It's a great honor to be here today, and particularly I'm honored by being associated with a founding psychologist because I consider myself as much a psychologist as a social scientist. <clears throat> My topic today is emotions and politics, as the Dean mentioned, a theory of destructive conflict. My talk will be based on two papers that can be found in the pipeline uh, on my website. And if you know how to spell my last name, you can find it, my website, by looking on Google in about a fourth of a second. Um, my theory is about male emotions and violence, and both of the papers on the website uh, have that title. I think a lecture is mostly wasted if it provides only information in the abstract and abstract reasoning. It's very hard to follow, for one thing. I think rather this occasion should be more personal and particularly a way of the audience getting to know the speaker a little bit and me getting to know the audience a little bit. To this end, I would prefer to tell some stories about myself, or on myself, as we say, that are closely related to my topic, which is male emotions, and to respond to your comments and questions. If we look at theories of irrational aggression and violence, we find that they are dominated by political and economic explanations. And sometimes these explanations work very well. The present crisis in U.S. foreign policy, I think, seems to me transparently about power, domination, and the economics of world resources. There are other conflict crises, however, in which the economic and political motives are not that clear. For example, in, in instigating the war on Vietnam, Lyndon Johnson, the then President of the United States, um, if you look carefully at the history of that period and of the, his biographies, his motives are, to me, very clouded. Uh, it's, it's not at all clear that this was purely a matter of politics, uh, economics, and I should have said ideology or doctrine. In the Bush regime, uh, doctrine seems to count quite a lot. Uh, but uh, the doctrinal influences on Johnson are not at all clear. If we go from the leaders in conflicts, um, looking for the motives of the conflict, if we go from the leaders to the followers, the situation gets even more murky. Uh, the political economics for the foot soldier, for the infantryman, seem to me very unrewarding. There's a great deal of risk and usually very little reward. And a rational choice uh, fighting in a war where you may be killed or killed others is not for a foot soldier or any kind of uh, active uh, combatant. It's, it, it's not, not a very rational choice. Now, 
In social science, because we're still in very early stages, uh, good predictors of behavior are very rare. Very hard to find a good predictor, something that predicts most behavior. But in the case of aggression and violence, there, is, there happens to be one excellent predictor. Very unusual situation. What is it, what is the variable that predicts aggression and violence very well? A really terrific predictor of aggression and violence is the male gender. If you look at the stats, it is overwhelming. Physical violence and aggression are initiated by men right down the line. 10 to 1, sometimes some situations 20 to 1. I recently looked at uh, a list of the suicide bombers in, uh, in Israel, the Palestinian suicide bombers, 30 to 1. And that's very typical. So if you want to predict, uh, if you want to find who's more likely to commit acts of aggression and violence, first you look at the men. Somebody asked me what would be, how could you find the sniper in Washington area? I'd say, well, it's going to be a man probably. And they say, well, isn't that politically incorrect? I said, yeah, it's politically incorrect, but the stats demand it. It's probably a man. A humiliated man. That's not as well. That's not as good a predictor, but it's my guess. The postal workers who went postal, you know what you know that phrase, going postal, you know what that means? <coughs> they all were fired in a humiliating way or in an unfair way. They were humiliated men and they killed. Uh, it's not really maleness that predicts violence, though. It's masculinity, which is a different thing. They've, they've looked for physical causes of aggression in men, and they haven't come up with much. For a while, they, there was some thought that the XY chromosome was going to be the answer, but it didn't. It fizzled out. Uh, there is a correlation between high testosterone levels and uh, violence and aggression, but it's not clear that it's a causal relationship. I'm going to talk about emotional relational causes of violence and aggression in men. Now the problem with talking about emotional relational causes is that in the West, in industrialized urban West, almost all, the whole emotional relational world is invisible. We don't notice what's going on in what I used to call the micro world. We're trained not to notice. There was a cartoon in the New Yorker about a year ago which says this very well. I know it's hard to translate a joke across cultures, so don't feel compelled to laugh. I won't be embarrassed if you don't laugh. There's a man lying on the couch in an analyst's office and he's saying to the analyst, look, Call it denial, if you will. But I think what goes on in my personal life is none of my own damn business. Thank you. A courtesy laugh. I think that cartoon is exactly right. We in the West are trained, socialized, to think that our personal life the web of relationships, the nature of our relationships, and our own emotions are none of our own damn business. Let me illustrate that from two incidents in my own life. I was actually a grunt during the Korean War. I allowed myself to be drafted in the Army when I didn't even have to go. I've been puzzling about that ever since. I was working as a physicist in a radiation lab in Berkeley. I was a graduate student in physics. And I could have been deferred forever if I had stayed with that. But I switched into sociology knowing full well 
that I would be then be drafted. Figure that one out. Well, here's what I've come up with. It's not satisfying. It's very cloudy. The first thing was, I was fascinated with social science, especially sociology and psychology, and I was bored with physics. Well, I could have waited until it was safe, but I didn't. What, what comes up in consciousness is, the second reason, is a sense of obligation. I felt that I was obligated to go to the Army when all of my friends and relatives were going. Not so much because my country had been good to me and my parents, although that was certainly true, but I didn't think about things like that in those days. I was only 25. But just out of a sense of fairness, I, think, I thought it was unfair that I should be safe and my friends and relatives in danger. <clears throat> now, there's a much darker reason also, which is very hard for me to find as I go spelunking down into my memory. Spelunking? Exploring caves? You know? I've done it. I've done a lot of exploring of this, but, and it's, it's still very foggy. I have the sense that I, I wanted to prove myself as a male. I'm embarrassed to tell you that. I wanted to show that I had what it takes to be a man, even though I don't think I was very conscious of that at the time. Now, if, if you start reading about young men's letters before wars, many different wars, you find that theme over and over again. See, I was an intellectual from the time I was four years old. I took to reading. I taught myself to read. And any time I was upset, which was quite often, I'd read a book. So I got a lot of reading done between 4 and 40. <clears throat> um, I was an intellectual, but I wanted to show myself, especially, that I was also a man. So I allowed myself to be drafted into the Korean War, and I was trained in an infantry re regiment, and I was ready to go to war. When the Army found out of my, my physics background, and they yanked me out of this infantry uh, company and stuck me in a technical job. But I would have gone and I would have fought. I didn't know any better. And it's interesting, too, because ideologically I was against it. I was against the war. I didn't know much about it, but I was a socialist in those days. And I thought it was a capitalist war, which turns out to be a little more complicated than that. But I was, I was not for, for it ideologically. I certainly didn't want to kill anybody. And I certainly didn't want to be killed myself. But I allowed myself to be drafted. There's another issue which I won't go into, but Hazlitt said that no man under 40 thinks he will ever die, and that was certainly true of me. Let me tell you another incident that occurred to me driving on the freeway. I took my life in my hands once more, and I was going to Los Angeles from Santa Barbara, which is about 100 miles, driving at about 70 miles per hour, which translated into kilometers is about 120, 130 kilometers per hour. Close enough? Okay. 130 kilometers per hour, and there's heavy traffic, cars all around me, cars in front of me, cars in back of me. And you won't believe this here in Norway, but there were cars passing me as I was doing 70 miles an hour. Some of them passing me very fast. Well, in front of me, I see this little light car weaving around, trying to get ahead of the pack. And they weave too fast and turn around and face me like this. Here I'm going 75, 70 miles an hour. 130 kilometers per hour, 
and I'm coming down on this car that stopped. I don't have time to look in the mirror to see if anyone is passing me on my left. I just, <laughs> I, I just missed that car. Now, what emotions did I feel as that was happening? Well, of course, I was surprised. I wasn't ready for that event. What other emotions did I display? Yes. You got a kick. It was a wonderful feeling. You got a, well, this was a little bit exciting. <laughs> A wonderful feeling of excitement. No, oh, sorry. Angry? Huh? Yes, yes. She says angry. I'm not sure it was angry. I'll let you be the judge. But as I am passing that car, I look at the driver, and that driver's window is rolled up, and my window is rolled up, but I scream anyway, you idiot! You nearly killed me! Didn't do any good. It was completely compulsive. I couldn't stop myself. I didn't think about it. The anger came flowing out of my mind. I'm surprised I didn't say something a little more colorful than that, but that's the best I could do at the moment. Well, I was shaken. It's not exactly the right phrase. I was upset for 20, 30 minutes as I'm driving along, but little by little, trying to keep alive, I um, forgot about it. But I was, some, I was somewhat tense during the day uh, at UCLA, and then I got in my little car and I drove back to Santa Barbara, and I get home and my wife greets me, and I say, oh, guess what happened to me today? She said, what? And I told her, and her face went white. And when I saw her face go white, I felt fear. I was afraid. I could have died. And I didn't know that until I saw her face. And I shook, and I sweated. I had a little fit of fear right on the spot. Now my question to you is, what happened to that fear during the day? Where did it go? Ponder that. Meditate on it. Because I think our fate as human beings depends on the answer that you give. My guess, and it's still a guess, is that my body was in a state of fear all day long, which I experienced only as tension, and that my body and my brain could not relax until it did its thing, its natural thing, which is to f experience fear cognitively and to shake and sweat physically and discharge the fear. Then I was no longer tense and I felt myself again. Now, I want you to appreciate what I'm saying because it's not widely <coughs> believed or discussed. I'm saying that shaking and sweating and feeling fear is the orgasm of the fear response it discharges the tension of fear. I said this 
1979 in a book I published, which is back in print, but was not widely read or appreciated. My books usually get fairly good reviews, but this one didn't. It's called Catharsis and Healing, Ritual and Drama. And all of the reviews, without exception, were extremely negative. And that's putting a good face on it, to put it that way. Because social scientists and psychiatrists think that the theory of, of catharsis has been disproved. They're mistaken, but they think that. Just to throw in another bombshell. What is the signal of the catharsis of anger? Is it yelling and screaming and hitting? Not according to my book. You want to guess what my book says is the signal that you are discharging anger? Anyone? You can say it in Norwegian if you like. Okay, anyone have a thought and you don't have to say it. <laughs> you see, it's a puzzle. If shaking and sweating is the physical signs of discharge of fear, what is the physical sign of discharge of anger? Well, according to my book, foolish little book, it says that it's body heat. That if your body gets very hot, you burn up the adrenaline, that it would take 10 kilometers to run off in a few seconds. Try that sometime. I, I'm going to sketch very briefly the theory of the emotional relational source of irrational aggression, in men especially. There have been some work by psychiatrists and others indicating that shame lies at the root of violence. There's a very well-known book in the United States by a psychiatrist whose name ought to be on the tip of my tongue, but it's not. It's called Violence, a National Epid Epidemic. You can find it that way. And he says that the violent prisoners that he knew as a prison psychiatrist were men who were deeply ashamed. And he almost says, but he doesn't quite come out with it, he almost says, but they, well, yeah, he does. He says, it's, but it's a certain kind of shame. It's a secret shame. The shame is a secret. Their shame is a secret. They're real tough on the outside, keeping the secret of shame to themselves. Well, that's a very important observation because shame, when you get into it, as I have, you find that shame is like all over. It happens to us all the time, shame, embarrassment, humiliation. So to say that shame causes violence is news from nowhere. There's too much shame and there's too little violence. But if it's a secret shame, that narrows the chase way, way down. Shame that is kept secret certainly from others, that's what the psychiatrist is talking about, You're a tough guy to others. But I would add to what he says, shame that is kept secret from yourself. Just as my fear after that near collision was a secret that I kept from myself. The kind of shame that leads to violence is shame that is a secret to self as well as others. It's what Helen Lewis called unacknowledged shame, or if she were going to be a little bolder, she would say unconscious shame. Now that's not enough. That's still not limited enough to be an explanation of irrational violence because there's a lot of unconscious shame, even in this room even inside of yours truly. It's very hard to get to. There has to be two other conditions, I argue, in these two papers. The next condition, there has to be 
a master obsession. That is, you are deluded in your thinking in a way that invades the whole rest of your cognitive structure. Now, when I was young and vigorous, I read every biography of Hitler that I could get my hands on. A very punishing experience, like swimming in the sewer. And I found that Hitler had a master obsession. And I think I could, and I think I demonstrated that in my 1994 book. He had many hatreds and prejudices, but there was one that encompassed them all, and that was his hatred of the Jews. He thought that Jews were out to conquer the world and therefore needed to be conquered. And that all the other enemies of Germany, they were just in the pay of Jews or hidden Jews themselves. And he really believed that. He was completely deluded about Jews. And he thought that if he eliminated the Jews, that the world would be a far better place and all of Germany's enemies would be disarmed. That was his master obsession. Okay, that narrows it down. Com completely repressed shame, a master obsession, and then finally a social phenomena, which I call isolation, or in attachment terms, avoidant attachment. Hitler was a completely isolated man. I went through all the candidates for closeness. Eva Brown, his war minister, the various people who might have been close to them, and they all gave the same testimony. Hitler was a mystery to them. He was completely detached. So it's the three conditions for irrational violence, especially on a large scale. All shame completely repressed that fits Hitler to a glove. He was extremely embarrassed about his person. He would go in the mirror and spend endless time getting ready for a television appearance. And he would ask all of his close associates, did he look foolish? Did he look ridiculous? Etc. 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 At the same time, he thought of himself as very masculine and macho. He was a, a whole structure of, of contradictions. So his shame was completely repressed. He had a master obsession and he was completely isolated from all other human beings from the age of six. From the age of six. Now, if we could find a woman who met all those criteria, then she would, and according to the theory, be as irrationally violent as a man. It's not maleness or femaleness, it's masculinity. Well, I'm coming to the end of my formal talk. Get ready with your questions and comments. After the twin trade towers were blown out of the sky, I wrote a little short paper about masculine violence, including both sides, all men, all 21 perpetrators were men. Uh, and I thought, how can we change our children? How can, how can we raise our children in a new way in which they won't be violent? And I came up with a mantra. It's kind of like the Boy Scout Oath, translated into emotional terms. I was a Boy Scout. Uh, I was an Eagle Scout. I was very proud when I was 13. This is a new oath for children. And the first part of it is just to say a very short sentence, I am afraid. That little sentence got me out of a very tough spot once. I was just learning at 40 that I was full of emotions and my life was threatened and I had to go and give a talk 
I was absolutely speechless, struck dumb. And I said to them out loud in my apartment, I said, this was during the Vietnam protest. I was the leader of the faculty group protesting the Vietnam War. And I can feel all the feelings from that era coming up. I had a long phone call from an anonymous phone caller who said he was going to kill me and my family. And I tried to keep him on the phone because I was hoping someone would pick up the conversation. The man was very violent. But finally he sensed that something's wrong and he hung up. So I'm supposed to go out and give a talk to 20,000 people. And I can't even say my own name. I'm so frightened. But then I did something different. I had taken some counseling and I tried to put into words my feeling. And I said, I am afraid. And I fell to the ground like a sack of potatoes. And I bathed my clothing in sweat and I shook like an earthquake. And when I got up after 15 minutes, my head was clear as a bell. And I went out, not knowing what I was going to say, and gave a, a talk for 10 minutes that was pure poetry. It was there, but it was covered by fear. That's the first sentence in the mantra. I am afraid to die. I fear for my parents and my brothers and sisters. My sense of being safe is always shattered. I want to feel safe again. That's the fear part. The second part, I feel violated, weak, helpless, impotent, incompetent, humiliated. I am ashamed of my own helplessness. I am ashamed I am ashamed that I cannot protect my own family. I am ashamed that I lack the foresight to, to see disaster coming. That's the shame part. This is the grief part. <clears throat> it's hard to say. I am sad beyond reckoning at all the losses that I, mine, and the human race have suffered. I need to cry bitter tears forever. If we could raise our children to say those words, the world would be a much safer place. Thank you. Well, I'm uh, fascinated uh, and uh, feel uh, humble after your presentation. So this may be sort of a too intellectual question, but still, uh, in several years ago, I was very fascinated by uh, your extreme critique of uh, labeling uh, in uh, psychiatry. And I think you did a valuable uh, thing uh, in uh, uh, not preventing, but stopping uh, some people from using diagnosis all the time. And in that connection, you talked about the uh, I-it relation from uh, Martin Buber. And I think uh, that's a tremendously important concept. So if you have some comments which could sort of tie in what you have uh, just now said about male violence uh, and uh, the Buberian perspective, the I though versus I it, at least I would be very grateful for that. Yes. Would you mind saying your name? My name is uh, Finn Chudi, psychologist. <laughs>
Yes, thank you. I've heard your name before. Um, I've been trying to connect my work on emotions with my labeling work. Uh, I've published several, several papers on that, uh, some of which are on the website. Um, <clears throat> the societal reaction to deviance, to use labeling language, I think is powered by shame responses. Uh, and labeling is an engine of shame. Uh, a stigmatized label is a label that brings shame. It's very odd, there's now very large literature on stigma, uh, and it doesn't discuss the emotional basis of stigma, which is, in Norwegian, I can say it in German, Shanda. Stigma is shame. Huh. My mother, in her Yiddish, when she was really angry at me, she would say, in Shanda and a harpa. Shameful. It took me many years to figure out what she meant by harpa. I, I, at first, when I was studying German, I thought she meant halpa, a shame and a half. That would be fairly funny. <laughs> but then I listened more closely. It was not halpa. It was harpa, which turns out to be a Hebrew word. You see, Yiddish is not entirely German. It's almost all German, but it's got few Hebrew words. Harpa is disgrace, a shame and a disgrace. A phrase that Hitler used, turned around. He was talking about the Weimar Republic when he was campaigning for chancellor, and he would say, he never called it my name, he would say, Svanzig Jahren von Schmach und Schanda. And the audience would go crazy. That was what aroused them the most. And Hitler promised to remove the shame of being German. Um, I have a paper recently published in Psychiatry uh, on depression, social components of depression. Psychiatric journals, for some reason unknown to me, usually turn down my submissions, but they love this one. Um, they not only published my paper, but they published four commentaries from psychiatrists on this paper. And it must have been an unusual atmosphere because three of the four commentaries are entirely positive. I'm not going to go into the theory of de the social component of depression. I'd have to take three long breaths to do that. I'd rather field another question or comment. Yes, um, my name is Arne Holton. I was a student in '68 and the '70s, and uh, you were one of our master heroes. Newman, Thomas Sass, Ronald D. Lane, David Cooper, and I think I should also mention Gregory Bates. And Irving got Okay. <laughs> now I'm not a student anymore. I'm a professor of psychology, and the world has changed. Um, I was one of the people that were opposing diagnosis. I refused to set diagnosis in our clinical training and so on. Now I'm studying diagnosis. We um, went through actually the literature to try to find out whether there were real empirical studies asking patients about what they thought about being diagnosed. Actually, we found there were very, very few studies, particularly if you looked into the details, like qualitative studies, of how patients that have got the diagnosis of schizophrenia, or personality disorder, or bipolar or manic depressive, depressive uh, illness experienced this. So we did it. 
And we came up with very, very different results from what you and Ron Lane and everybody had said that how the world should be. The uh, experiences were far, far more nuanced. There were far more shaded shades in this. Far more shades, nuances. Um, difference, it was far more differentiated. Actually, um, some of the patients were very happy to get a diagnosis because they finally understood what was going on. Some of them felt a terrible stigma. Some of them felt that they got an explanation to their parents why they did as they did and so on. And uh, these patients um, also told us that their experience with the diagnosis was very dependent upon who they were and where they were and when it was in their process. So sometimes it was actually very helpful and sometimes it was terrible. And the terrible thing was when people couldn't see them as, as anything else but being schizophrenic, for instance. Can you now, play that sentence again? Uh, uh, the terrible thing was when people could not see them as anything else but being schizophrenic. Yeah. It was a kind of a fence yeah. or, um, between them and the rest of the world. But the theory that stigma could create disorders I don't think is true. Do you? In 1966, when I published that yeah. book, I was, I had on my sociologist hat, and I was doing what I think of now as single issue academics. Labeling, period. Now I know better. What happens in the course of what's called mental illness, is a complex matter of which labeling is only one component. I was much more careful in this recent article on depression. I said a theory of the social component of depression, one component, many other things going on. Um, let me shift away a little bit from diagnosis and onto treatment. What's important these days is Diagnosis is no longer once had the importance it once had, and never was very important actually. What's important these days is the treatment, because most psychiatric treatment is what? In Norwegian. Say it. Attention. What? Attention. Drugs. Medication. Medication. Drugs. Actually. Uh, you medicate first and ask questions late, later. That's an old Western cowboy idea. Shoot first, ask questions later. The George Bush motto. <laughs> My wife is both a sociologist and a practitioner. Her name is Suzanne Ratzinger. She wrote a wonderful book about marital quarrels called Violent Emotions. She took videos of 12 couples quarreling, including us. <laughs> I thought I did a good job in the quarrels until I saw one of them on videotape. I said, that's not me. And she said, well, who is it? <laughs> I said, that's my dad. <laughs> she was very angry, Suzanne. And she said, well, so, and I said, I don't want to live like this. And she said, well, what are you going to do about it? And I said, let's go to a marriage counselor. And that's what happened. Fortunately, she didn't publish our case, or I wouldn't be able to look you in the face here today. She did four other couples, and she shows the second-by-second second exchange of emotions. And... I might call insults, although the people aren't mostly, mostly aren't conscious that they're insulting each other, in these four quarrels. It's a revelation. But not as much of a revelation as catching yourself on video during a quarrel with a person you're close to. That's a real revelation. 
Uh, she's at the moment working as a grief counselor in hospice. You understand? Hospice, uh, grief counseling. And she tells very frightening stories about what is being done to people who are trying to mourn their losses. What is that? Medications, drugs. Instead of allowing a person to feel the grief, they are medicated on antidepressants if they've been doing it for longer than three or four weeks. Very frightening. So what we're going to have to do right now is to do something about over-medication with psychotropic drugs, some of which are extremely dangerous. Now, I'm not a fanatic. I believe that there's a place for psychotropic drugs. I've seen good results. I just think they're prescribed about 100 to 1 too much. And that's the real danger that we're facing today, much more than diagnosis. I'm uh, Anne Haugestad. Uh, I was fascinated by your example of, or your own experience with uh, your wife Faith telling you that you had been in danger. So um, I'm a mother of two boys and since uh, the oldest of them once were out of my control, I didn't know where he was, I had to, uh, I realized that I couldn't always protect him, well that he was five years or three years or something. So um, my um, strategy has been to think that whenever there is a situation when they need to choose between doing something dangerous or not, and I'm not there, and they are perhaps together with other men who want them to do the dangerous thing, I want them to remember me. <laughs> and think, and be able to say to them, it's not that I don't dare to do it, but my mother, it would kill my mother. <laughs> do you think this is uh, um, a way of using your theory? <laughs> that, was, that was very nice. Down home, as we say in American English, right down at the guts of things what to do with our boys. Yes, I think that follows, but I'm afraid it wouldn't be a very effective. I think that's the last thing that a young boy wants to say to his uh, fellows. Because what they want to show to each other that they are independent, not only of their mother, especially of their mother, but even of their father. Uh, so I, I, I don't think that would work, I'm sorry. I think more important, there, there's a step back that you need to take with the boys before that. And that is encouraging them to talk about what they feel with you. They will do that. If you are patient with them and not critical of what they feel, you can be critical of their behavior. In fact, you must be as a parent. But you mustn't be critical of what they feel. I know that when I was a child, I was in deadly terror that my father would think I was a coward. And I didn't tell him that, and I didn't tell my mother that or anyone. So I've been a very reckless male for a long time. <coughs> took me a long time to get over that. A lot of therapy. I'm not quite over it yet. To think that I could get on a jet plane <laughs> and arrive here in shape to give a coherent talk, that's pretty reckless. Um, that's what I was thinking about last night at 3 in the morning when I was hearing the disco across the street and not sleeping. But I'm off the subject. I'm sorry. But do you see what I'm saying? A child needs to talk about their feelings with somebody. And most kids don't want to hear about it. And their teachers don't have time. So the parents or sibling is a good place to start. Tell me what you feel. Now with boys, they will apt to be saying, well, I don't feel anything. 
I'm all right. But you said, you know, if, if you're patient and you keep listening, and then tell me about your day. That's even good with your, with your spouse. What happened to you today? Tell me about your day. Most men, that they will start with that and be very brief. But you say, well, equal time. I want to tell you about my day. And then you get longer and longer and longer and talk about feelings. And then they'll get mad. Why are you going on and on and on and on? But then after several months of this, they'll notice that you feel better after you've told them about your feelings. And then they might try it. That's what I did. I said, well, she's going on and on and on. I'll go on and on. And I discovered I was full of feelings from the day that I didn't even know were there. That's the beginning. That's the first step. So children need to learn to talk about their feelings. When parents are the best ones to talk about them. My name is Christine Skagia, and I'm very afraid of coming up here and asking you a question, just so you know that. Um, and um, uh, you're talking about shame. And uh, I'm thinking to myself, what is shame? What causes shame? And I've tried to um, find out a little bit about this, and I've read in your book that you are um, referring to Goffman, and uh, he's saying something about afraid or uh, yeah afraid of being evaluated negative or afraid of evaluation. I don't know if you can elaborate that a well, little bit more. It's not quite what he says. Okay, but you're on the right track. Yeah. So if you can say something yeah. about yeah. the the origin of of shameness, <coughs> and why is it difficult to be? Yeah. I appreciate your mentioning your fear. That was very touching. Uh, in order to talk about shame, I have to say, first of all, that my approach is different than most psychologists who talk about evaluation of self, which is very cognitive. And I think that shame, fear, grief, and anger are elementals, primitives. They are biological in base. And it can happen to a baby before language and before and precognitive even. There's some evidence for that in the work of the developmental psychologist, Electronic, showing precursors of shame, fear, and grief in babies long before language, in fact, shortly after birth. Uh, I part with most psychologists by saying that the primary component of these elemental emotions is not cognitive, but bodily, physical response. And I, I'm really glad that you asked that question, or else it, it would be hard for you to understand the theory that I pre pre presented without me answering the question. Because I define shame socially as the signal of a threat to the bond. That includes the psychological definition. I'll let you think about how that includes it. Shame, in the English language, is a very ambiguous word for the signal of the threat to the bond. So it's a relational emotion like most emotions. Grief is a relational emotion, but it <coughs> doesn't occur all the time. It's about a signal loss of an attachment. It's not the stuff of everyday conversation, grief. But shame, embarrassment, and humiliation is. Because we are always seeing ourselves as others see us. That's Goffman. And when you do that, you have not only a cognitive reaction, but an emotional reaction. And that is Cooley, Charles Horton Cooley, who said it loud and clear in talking about the looking glass self. When we see ourselves as others see us, we have a cognitive and an emotional reaction. 
And the emotional reaction is almost always either pride or shame. And so pride and shame are the very emotional center of virtually all discourse, all conversations. Okay, so we, uh, in order to help people to understand us, we have to put ourselves in their head. But in putting ourselves into their head, we're seeing ourselves as they see us. So we're awash in pride and shame when we're talking to other human beings. Is that good news or is it bad news? 